Good evening and welcome back to the Rural Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Dr Lucy Ingram. Following on from the earlier case presentation, we will shortly hear what happened when DM returned. Discussing this tonight, we have an expert panel consisting of Professor Scott Kitchener, experienced rural GP, Medical Director of QRME, Clinical and Academic Lead of Rural Health at Griffith University and Research Lead in Agricultural Health and Medicine Research at the University of Southern Queensland. Welcome back, Scott. Thanks. Um, we have Dr Spencer Toons, Staff Specialist Physician at Toowoomba General Hospital and Part-Time Medical Educator with QRME. Welcome, Spencer. Thank you, Lucy. And Ms Greer Dowell, Clinic Manager at St Andrews Toowoomba Dialysis Clinic. Welcome, Greer. Thank you. Can we all please welcome our specialist and expert panellists? As usual, we are being live streamed around Australia. We have a number of participants watching remotely, so I encourage you all to join the discussion by emailing your question to grandrounds at qrme.org.au or you can tweet your questions using the hashtag now on your screen. Returning for the follow-up presentation tonight is Dr Hilary Vinson from Enrolled. Please put your hands together for Hilary. <laughs> Thanks, Lucy. Thanks everybody. Okay, so like we said, what happens next? This part of the talk is more about, um, we're gonna talk about kidney disease because essentially at the end of the day with our microvascular complications, the kidney is one thing that does um, get injured quite frequently. So let's just do a few again, warm up slides for uh, renal failure and some definitions. So very recently, renal failure or acute renal failure has been um, renamed. So we're calling it now acute kidney injury. We've got a, a background um, definition of chronic kidney disease. And this is what we mentioned before uh, with the endocrinologist about, you know, it, it's progressive and we've got to think about medicines. We've got to think about volume depletion. And of course, it's one of the comorbid conditions. But acute kidney injury, I think, speaks, it's a much better, uh, you know, set of words or acronym because it actually does appreciate the smaller decrements in the kidney function that don't necessarily actually turn into overt kidney failure, um, but they can be of substantial clinical relevance. And also one of those cue points as well that we might be able to show the patients in our relationship with them that they are losing their kidney function and it's time to make change. Um, so certainly we do end up having the kidney in, uh, injury happens on a cellular level, a cellular level uh, to the glomerulus um, and we end up with retention of the urea and other nitrogenous wastes. Um, we do lose the protein in the urine and we end up with you know, swelling and extravascular volume uh, dysregulation. We now save ARF or acute renal failure um, for severe injuries that are going to end up uh, implying the need for a renal replacement. So I remember, you know, grand rounds or grand rounds or morning rounds, you'd say, you know, Mr. J has got acute, uh, you know, kidney failure or renal failure. You know, now we, if we said that, we would mean that he needs a transplant, not that he has chronic kidney disease. So in terms of uh, epidemiology, so this is interesting. They did a study and they had about 5,000 people in this study and from the diagnosis of their type 2 diabetes, after 10 years, 25% of them were at that first sort of level um, of acute kidney injury. 5% of them actually went on, you know, in that same length of time to have severe proteinuria and, you know, at that sort of second level of that acute kidney injury. And almost 1% from 10 years of diagnosis actually had an elevation in their creatinine and um, or met the requirements for uh, renal replacement. So when if we go back thinking about what we were talking about before, when you diagnose somebody, we need to get onto these people quite quickly because there is a measurable amount of people that are going to, going to actually progress through their kidney malfunction quite quickly. Um, and again, patients with their increased uh, albuminuria um, due to type 2 diabetes, um, with good glycemic control, we can actually see regression and improvement in their renal function. So there's hope, you know, it's not a, a terminal thing. Again, sequelae and com comorbidities with renal failure. So we're quite often accompanied by uh, hypertension, um, high uh, lipids, 
uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, etc., and of course our cardiovascular diseases. So um, in dealing with the patient in general practice and or if they're in the hospitals, we really want to be able to diagnose, we're thinking about these things and we're going to manage them together as a complete care for our patient with type 2 diabetes. Okay, so I couldn't resist thinking about the, the glomerulus myself. So I thought, what does it really do? Like, what does the glomerulus happen <laughs> when you've got <laughs> diabetes yes. to the kidney? And I really, you know, I loved <laughs> the microscopy yes. and stuff at, at uni. And so structurally and functionally, stuff happens. So you get this thing called glomerulus sclerosis. You get mesangial expansion, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and importantly, you get glomerular basement membrane thickening. And of course, this then we try to measure using our fancy blood tests. And we see rise in serum creatinine, um, our increases in the blood urea nitrogen. We see decreases in the ability for the basement membrane inside the glomerulus to actually filter. So our EGFR goes down. And of course, that can lead to decrease in urine output. And those functional things is what we use to, to you know, monitor these people and also you'll see in a minute with the criteria um, how it starts to make sense. So here it is, the glomerulus. So very quickly. Um, so on the right hand side of your screen, you see there's a normal one. And again, kind of the same way we talked about before about the retina um, from the optometrist. If you just look, the left, the right hand side one, this is a normal one. If we look at the right hand side one, we actually in this one we see nodular glomerulosclerosis. But just appreciate the left hand side one looks quite congested and where the ends are, those actually are the nodules. So we can see that, that this change is occurring and it's occurring really on that cellular level because all those little black dots, right, are cells. Second one and last one. Again, on the right-hand side is a normal glomerulus. I want you to look at the, at the left-hand side one and see this is what these glomeruli will look like in advanced uh, diabetic nephropathy. And again, if patients are interested and if you can show them that these are the differences that are happening right inside their own kidney, and yes, they could appreciate that there's change there, terrific. So um, light, microsco light microscopy. <laughs> All right, so moving on to the criteria, of how we start thinking about, does this person have acute kidney injury? Did we give them a medicine that caused acute kidney injury? Um, it often happens accidentally in hospitals or you know, uh, as a bipartisan of them being in hospital. So we look at serum creatinine or their um, GFR and, and or we can look at their um, urine output. The rifle criteria, as you can see, there stands for like the levels of their kidney damage. So we'll get one level, which I'll show you in a second, which is showing this person's at risk of their kidneys being injured. Then they'll have another level, which is an injury. Then we have another level, which is failure. And then we have loss <coughs> of kidney function and then end stage renal disease. And they're based on things that we can do in our general practice. We can do in the hospitals with serum creatinine, EGFR and urine output measurements. So this is the rifle criteria. <clears throat> having a look at that risk one. So what we need to have, if we could think about what his GFR was before, he's got a 1.5 increase in it, or has his, um, oh sorry, for his creatinine, 1.5 increase, or has his EGFR decreased by greater than 25%. We can measure that. He has his urine output, and importantly here, the only thing that changes with the urine output, um, essentially, is the amount of time that um, you know, they're, they're producing this uh, lower amount of uh, urine output per kilo. So you've got like less than 0.5 mils per kilo for six hours, we're at risk, we've got problems. For 12 hours, we've got some kidney injury going there and certainly failure if you become anuric or if you've produced less than 0.3 of a mil per kilo of urine per hour uh, for 24 hours. Um, on the EGFR criteria, we essentially go from, if you thought just about GFR, greater than 25% to reduction, greater than 50% reduction, or greater than 75% reduction. And this falls into a place where we may be able to, with some um, therapy, you know, see them regress or improve. Um, of course, at the failure point and certainly at the loss point um, is unfortunately where there's nothing much more that can be done. 
um, and may end up being a renal replacement. Okay, let's go back to the case. So Mr. DM, he's our, our guy, 57 years old, and he, um, he returns to us six months later. Hey, we did such good follow-up, six months. <laughs> um, <laughs> We asked ourselves, you know, what sort of follow-up should we be doing with these people? Like, we really, he's had part of his foot amputated already. Like, somehow we should be calling him or, you know. Um, he today presents feeling generally unwell. He's a bit tired. He's um, had some nausea and actually he's been vomiting every day for weeks. Um, and he can barely eat. Um, and again, living out of town and sort of we talked briefly about before, people quite can be embarrassed about their health and he's not presented early. So this has been going on for quite some time. He's um, able to keep fruit and toast and yogurts down and he sleeps, it's sleeping all the time, but he still feels tired, Doc, like you've got to help me here. And um, as for his usual morning walk, well, he just doesn't have the energy to do it anymore. So just uh, recapping on his past medical history. So we have all of our sequelae and comorbidities there. So having a look at the medications after, after his review, <coughs> pardon me, so... Uh, as we can see, we've kept the metformin, he's still on azisomeprazole, and certainly, potentially, his blood pressure medications, um, as we mentioned before, could be problematic. He's still on his metazapine, aspirin, and now we have him on his mixotard insulin. So looking at him today, so we're trying to find the cause <coughs> of why he feels this way. So he's afebrile, blood pressure's still elevated. Um, his weight's come down, though. And he's got a BMI of 34.3 now, and his waist circumference also reduced. So we have had an effect on this man, you know, and he may have lost weight more recently due to his nausea and vomiting if it had been going on for, for a longer period of time. Um, so general inspection, that end of the, the bed test, you don't look well, but cardiovascular is normal, chest is okay, abdomen soft, and his feet are in remarkably good condition. We must have been an excellent podiatrist that we sent him to. <laughs> um, so we've had a look at our investigation. So we did a chest x-ray. Now we're doing sort of a, almost a septic workup, but we're just, you know, throwing the net what's going on with him. So chest x-ray is okay. Full blood count, a little bit anemic. At iron studies, which we added on after seeing that uh, hemoglobin, we see is consistent with iron deficiency. His HbA1c is still high. But uh, as Sheila mentioned before, you know, being less than 8.5 is a good sign that it's, you know, it's on its way down. And having a look at his lipids, if we just remember, we actually saw that um, we actually did take out his statin um, because we were concerned about his liver function. So his cholesterol um, still leaves to be desired for. User knees. Now, we're going to have a close look here, and more importantly, at the EGFR, creatinine and urea. And I've just included the bloods from six months ago so we can see the change. Um, having a look at his liver function tests as well, they're you know, quite similar still, but now we've got uh, reduction in the uh, functioning or the production of the, of the liver with reduced protein and albumin probably being lost as well. So what will we say? EGFR from 46 to 16. <laughs> is it half? Is it 50%? Is it what are we down? <clears throat> We're down more than 50%. So if we go thinking back about with that uh, rifle criteria, we're at the, you know, moving, sorry. Here I go. I'm going back. So increased EGFR, like decreased greater than 50%. So we are certainly at a, mm. you know, kidney injury area. His creatinine was 400 today. His previous was 176. So we certainly see it's more than doubled. All right, I'm going forward again. Here I go. So we've got someone who is in a state of acute kidney injury. We also see him in the, uh, sodium and potassium, or potassium elevated and sodium low. This is uh, pertinent as well. So we, um, have, and having uh, talked with Mr. DM, we need to sit down with him and uh, unfortunately tell him that we do feel that, you know, he's starting to meet the criteria of certainly having um, acute kidney injury and he's moving, you know, quickly towards renal failure. 
Um, so again, he was contacted uh, back up to Emerald Hospital and we took him in there and he uh, had some IV access. We did some very judicial fluids mm -hmm. um, and certainly in talking about that, we'll be very interested to hear what you guys think in terms of a, a push-pull option with fluids and, and what the evidence is around that. Antiemetics for not feeling well. And then he was transferred to that second level hospital um, under the care of a general physician. Go. All right. So we're going to go back to the panellists now again. And uh, we'll start with some of these questions. Um, so do you mind if I actually start um, with Scott as a rural GP? A patient like this walks in um, to your clinic. Um, what, what do registrars need to do? What's urgent that they need to do now and, and what can be put off till a bit later? What did he present with? Was it a, was it a routine follow-up that you contacted him and got him back into the practice? He just presented not feeling well, not eating, vomiting, okay, so he's presented nausea. with the nausea and vomiting. So yeah. you've got to do, you've got to take a full history and see what he's been doing for the last six months. I think you've got to take a good medication history particularly. Um, in this case, I would be really interested in taking a social history to see it looks to me like he's having a social failure. Did you actually take his licence off him by any chance? We, I think he'd actually had it taken from him. So, you know, for, for people living in rural areas where there is no transportation other than a car or Shanks pony, then, you know, you've really got to consider what impact that has on his diet, for instance, and his socialisation. And so I think you've got to take all of those histories. Uh, and then a good examination is necessary because... Uh, the possibilities would have to be considering uh, another septic episode. Uh, I think you've got to look to see how he's using his insulin and whether that's actually being used. Mm. Um, so there's a, there's a really important examination to be done. Um, so uh, in terms of what a registrar should do first, that's what they should do first. And then if they're fortunate enough to have the opportunity to do a telemed consult, I think this is a really wonderful opportunity to call Spence and have a discussion about the patient that then turns into an education about the patient as well. <laughs> because this is really complex. Uh, you know, there's a big social uh, overlay, I suspect, but the immediate issues are that he's in, you know, that's a massive drop in his GFR. Uh, I'd be very concerned about that. So Spencer, the registrar, contacts you um, via telemedicine or all the patient ends up on your doorstep as a general physician. Um, you know, how's your approach to a patient with these issues? Oh, that's a good question. Mm. So th this patient has um, lobbed up, and I think this is one of those patients that would actually be quite difficult to manage in, in the general practice. And I guess it depends on you know, how bad is their nausea, how bad is their vomiting, how acute is that problem. Mm. Uh, because clearly the numbers on their blood tests now look awful. The numbers that they had on their blood tests six months ago weren't too bad. They weren't good, but they weren't too bad. And the question is how acutely this has happened and how much of it is acutely reversible. So how much of this is an acute kidney injury? How much of this is a marker of you know, a series of acute kidney injuries that are now turning into chronic renal impairment? Um, and I guess I'm hopeful, you know, the clue, he's not eating and drinking, OK? He's in emerald, it's summertime. Uh, you know, can we just tip a couple of litres of fluid into this guy, get him reperfusing his kidneys and, and, and shift his GFR up a little bit higher? Um, we probably don't need to enter into the argument about whether EGFRs are, are, are useful. They are a very useful number. But the, a circumstance where they're not as useful as we would like them to be is in the acutely sick patient. That's where they're not validated for use in that setting. Mm -hmm. And so if this guy is acutely dehydrated or septic mm -hmm. or has another or is obstructed or has, you know, so a pre-renal or a renal or a post-renal um, component to, to their injury and we can track that down and fix it promptly, mm -hmm. um, his, his numbers may get a lot better and it's really going to be the chronic number, the number that he's consistently scoring at or averaging that we're most interested in terms of managing you know, his degree of kidney disease. So we don't, we don't really know yet how much kidney disease... He, well, he's got, we know he has kidney disease. Yeah. His GFR was never good um, but, and now it's a lot worse. But is it going to bounce back or is this all he's got? Is this what we're stuck with? Um, so I guess in terms of the education, my instinct as a hospital-based specialist is to bring this man into hospital where we can make a careful assessment of his volume status, we can make a careful you know, look for, for other causes of pre-renal injury such as a, you know, a cardiac problem or a septic problem, 
Uh, we can image his kidneys and see uh, see whether there's a, a, a post renal problem. Has he got stones? Has he got a big prostate? Is there something uh, you know clagging off there? And certainly the, the 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 imaging is an important test to do first. But another test we really need to see is what's in his urine. And if we get some warm urine, we send it off to somebody clever. They have a look at it under a microscope and uh, has it got uh, lots of red cells? What shape are they? Has it got casts? Has it got chunks of uh, chunks of white cells all mashed up that suggest there's an acute uh, nephritis underway, uh, and how much protein is there? So is he, uh, you know, what, what, uh, you know, a spot albumin creatinine ratio, protein creatinine ratio, and for someone crook like this, you probably would collect 24 hours worth mm -hmm. of urine and, and, and accurately measure the, uh, the, the 24 hour protein excretion. And then what you do next is really going to depend on, on what those, what those test results are and, uh, and which way you go. Um, certainly on, on, on the story that we're given, I, I want to tip a couple of litres of fluid into this guy um, and I'd probably, uh, and we're certainly going to review his, his drugs and think about the nephrotoxins and, and the things that need to be, uh, perhaps need to be temporarily withheld. Yeah. And the reality is he'd be, you'd have him in Emerald Hospital for a day or two, reperfusing him mm. while you were yeah. getting his results back. And what's the turnaround you've got in Emerald for getting GFRs at, at all? Oh, we can do it. It's quite good. In the hospital there and also in the community, we can get them in, the, in a couple of hours. And, of course, wow. for the protein-creatinine ratio, because we do a lot on our obstetric women and pregnant women, we can get them sometimes within the hour. Okay. That's fantastic. Yeah. Mm. It is good. Mm. Um, so this guy, you know, has a lot of complex issues. Um, so maybe I might come back to Spencer in terms of um, we're talking about his kidneys primarily tonight but there was a few other sort of organs involved there. What are your thoughts on some of his blood tests that came back as well okay. more generally? All right. Um, well, there's a couple of couple of clues there. So clearly, this is a, a middle-aged, complicated diabetic who has previously had, you know, micro and macrovascular disease. So, you know, cardiovascular risk management and cardiovascular disease has to be in the back of your mind the whole time. Um, you've presented us. There's an elephant in the room, and that's his iron deficiency. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, iron levels are very difficult to assess generally in renal failure because they generally run a sort of inflammatory state, and the ferritins are often high, but the patient is functionally iron deficient. Not the case for this guy. He is genuinely iron deficient um, and he's got a microcytic anemia to go with it. So you know, where is he bleeding from? Um, is, he, is he not eating any red meat? That seems inconceivable for a patient from central Queensland. Um, and uh, I think you know, he's at, at some point he's going to need an endoscopy and a colonoscopy uh, and he's going to need iron supplementation. Now, I, I think the other clue here, clearly um, Progressive renal failure is associated with uh, a failure of erythropoietin, and so some sort of um, erythropoietin analogue replacement may well become uh, a part of your medium-term management for his anaemia. Uh, it probably doesn't need anything immediately done about it because the hemoglobin 98 is neither here nor there from a from a um, functional perspective. But um, but uh, no amount of erythropoietin is going to solve his problem until you replace his iron. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, there are other clues. Um, well, his diabetes isn't dreadful. His cholesterol is not not terrible, particularly given that we've stopped his um, stopped his, his statin. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm always inclined to keep going with the the, uh, the statin myself, but mm. <laughs> that's because I see a lot of cardiovascular disease, and I want to manage his you know, additional risk factors apart from his diabetes. Mm. Yeah. It is interesting how much better his um, his lipid screen's gotten. Yeah. Despite the fact that you've stopped an effective treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look, I think. Um, I think there might be a there's a there's a clue here that this is probably a bit more than than the six months that we've that we've labelled it with because I also find it a bit inconceivable that he's lost 23 kilograms. But you know, if that that, that degree of weight loss and obviously that degree of care for his diabetes has obviously been associated with you know metabolic improvements over over the period of time that we've that we've not seen him for. Yeah. So um, this patient has made a concerted effort to change things, change his lifestyle, improve his diet, improve his diabetes. You know, after the last presentation. Um, but now he's come in with his kidneys in a bad way. How do we manage that as GPs? Look, I think you've got to also... Undoubtedly the kidney's in a bad way, but he's in a bad way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think he's having uh, all sorts of trouble. And uh, common things still occur commonly. How old is he again? 57. And he's lived the central Queensland lifestyle of a truck driver. So mm -hmm. what are his chances of having a colorectal cancer? Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think you're, you're absolutely right. We've got to consider all of the other things, like the like he has to have um, scoping upper and lower if you can do it. And I believe that you'd be able to do that at, at a regional hospital like we, Emerald. We can do them, yes. And so I think that's really quite important. As the guy goes back into the home, though, I think you've got to engage whatever social services that you can. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I 
would anticipate that he's gotten into this state. If, if you rule out the, the common things such as he's got a bleeding ulcer or he's got a colorectal cancer mm -hmm. um, and he doesn't have a prostate cancer that's bleeding or, or so, something along those lines, mm -hmm. then you've really got to consider that he's put himself into this state perhaps with some aberrant dietary arrangement and maybe did lose 23 kilos by going on some starvation diet, maybe got his twos and fives around the wrong way and uh, you know, his, his <laughs> diet at the very least is off. Um, and I think, you know, I hark back to the, to the driver's licence because for, for rural people, it is so key to mm. their engagement with the world yes. um, that, and, and particularly he's a, he's a driver by trade, a professional driver. Mm. You know, I, I, I'm, I get the argument that if they have a persistently out of control diabetes that you really need to consider um, whether or not they should drive. But to me, this is highly likely to be someone who has not then engaged in the world, not got a reasonable diet, um, and, and as a result, their, their physiology is, has really gone off on a beam. It is interesting that you say that, because as we engage with the community in lots of different levels, that's what really does make the biggest mm. difference, I think. And unfortunately, like with this man, overall looking at his picture, he's had you know chronic illness for quite some time. He lost his job. He's you know mm. socially, it's you know it's almost part of the syndrome mm. that is part of, you know becoming um, more and more prevalent with us. We're a bit more isolated. Mm. We're not involved as much, and we kind of end up here. Mm. And mm. so that's something that's super important, I think, as GPs to be aware of that and and get people engaged. Know your services. Mm tell them to yeah, get out there and be part of things. He's mm. also got that history of depression. Mm. Uh, and so I think with everything that's happened and the loss of licence, then that would be something that you would probably look at as well, mm. whether his depression's managed mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah, being on Mataz still um, mm. with diabetes, I think there's got to be some other way you can deal with it. It's, a, it's the real popular drug at the moment for intractable depression where you're not making any other effort. You know, someone like this, um, motivational counselling mm. and CBT, you know, all work engaging him back into the community yeah, works uh, um, in, in managing his depression rather than just using Mataz. And, and diet, like they say food is mood and we talked a lot about mm. those inflammatory foods and non-inflammatory foods so that can be of great help too. So supposing, um, Spencer, that um, his kidney injury doesn't improve, is he going to wind up on dialysis? Do you think? Uh, if his kidney injury doesn't improve, then I think the answer to that question is yes, it mm. is. You know, he's got a... Um, if, if at the end of the day, once we've you know, fixed his drugs and fixed his mm. fluid balance and, and, and scanned and looked and, and done all of those things, if we can't get his GFR above 15, then he will, he's going to come mm. to renal replacement therapy and fairly promptly. Mm -hmm. You know, if we can buy him another 15 by fiddling, then maybe we can buy him another year. So mm. I guess... Uh, and again, the, the rule of thumb about one one mil per minute per, per month mm. for, for for kidney deterioration. Um, so if, if you can get him 15, you'll you'll get him 12 months of, of extra time. And that, 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 that's that's a, one of those broad generalisations that's only sometimes true. Um, but if he but if he stays at 15, and certainly if he gets down to, to 10, um, then he'll he'll need dialysis. Yep. Mm. So, um, come here as our renal nurse. Um, so, if this um, gentleman does come to see you guys in the clinic, mm -hmm. um, what's your role? Can you tell us a bit more about what you do for the patients that, that come to see you? Yeah, probably the nursing role I sort of see as sort of a hub and spoke kind of thing. The nurse seems to spend the most time maybe with the patient. Um, so, they link in everybody that needs to get linked in. Um, probably for the patient, it is just a huge change to their lifestyle. And even when they consent to dialysis, they actually have no idea what that means. Yeah. None Absolutely. whatsoever. <laughs> and of all the patients that I've nursed over the years, some say to me, if I knew what it was like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done it. Mm. So we, we try really, really hard with education and, and you know treatment options and all those things. Um, yeah, so it's about informing the person, building that relationship. Because mm -hmm. if they become a dialysis patient, you know, you might be their nurse for 20 years, 10 years, mm -hmm. 5 years, whatever. So getting that relationship and then knowing that person well enough to know when they're well and when they're not um, and when maybe intervention needs to happen. But um, it's a really full-on situation for the patients. Um, usually they'll get some sort of central catheter uh, for dialysis if it, if it is that bad and he's not going to improve. Um, and then they're on the dialysis machine, basically. 
What are some of the challenges for someone in a rural area, um, you know, that, that's going yeah. to need dialysis? Um, so for someone in a, in a rural area, um, it's probably even more life-changing than for people in metropolitan areas. Um, so they're completely displaced from everyone and everything that they know. Um, and they end up um, in a dialysis unit or a hospital where they actually know nobody and their family, you know, if they've got family, um, can't actually travel 500 kilometres to visit mm. them. So um, the isolation that people feel um, yeah, is huge. Um, and obviously for someone like this gentleman who has that chronic burden of disease as well as depression, as well as here you are on dialysis, um, he would need a lot of um, help, not only nursing, but psychology and obviously everybody else mm -hmm. in the team. Um, we would give him obviously treatment options and give him education about that. Mm -hmm. um, the good thing with um, peritoneal dialysis is that patients can return home. Mm -hmm. um, so he would be able to do peritoneal dialysis no problem in Emerald. Um, he would be trained to do that, but that would take a little while, and then he would be able to go home. Mm. But obviously, if, if he becomes unwell with that, mm. then it usually is he's referred then back mm. to the main hospital. Yeah, and so just um, the specialist, how um, safe do you think um, you know things like in-home dialysis, whether peritoneal or hemodialysis, is for someone who's rurally placed, um, you know, with chronic comorbidities? Yeah, look, it's tough. I, th I think the, uh, the, there are advantages and disadvantages to all of your dialysis modalities mm. for a patient like this. So, mm. um, so the clear cut advantage of peritoneal dialysis is that um, most patients can do that at home. Mm. Um, they can do it for themselves. Um, uh, certainly when I, when I was a dialysis doctor, which was a long time ago now, uh, it was mostly about manual exchanges. Now the vast majority of patients are running on automated machines that just exchange for them during the night time. Uh, but they take one of they learn how to use it in yeah. centre and then you know demonstrate uh -huh. they can use it and then go home. So peritoneal dialysis has the advantage that um, that, it, that it's home based, um, relatively convenient. They don't have a glucose problem because they're tipping glucose into their tummy, which will sit there and diffuse out during the during the during the night time and then be all sucked out before they hop off their machine in the morning. Um, the disadvantage for a diabetic patient and particularly for mm. someone like this who's you know, on his own and, and in the middle of nowhere is uh, you, know, you need good vision to be able to see the equipment to, to, to deal with it. You need um, you know, good cleanliness and it's very easy to get, a, uh, to get a peritonitis if you contaminate your connections and it's very easy to get a tunnel infection where the catheter tunnels through into your tummy and uh, so your diabetic patient uh, by dint of their, their immunosuppression is going to be uh, at higher risk for both of those things. Um, in terms of hemodialysis, um, obviously if you're going to do it acutely then it's usually with a central line of some kind. If you've got a little bit of time to get ready then you try to get some access in place but they've got vascular disease and often cardiovascular disease so getting a fistula to take, um, you know, you, whether you'd use a graft or otherwise and, and having you know, adequate blood flow in peripheral vessels to, to, to form and, oh, and function a fistula right. is a challenge and then uh, putting them on the machine intermittently results in um, additional cardiovascular strain with each, with each episode of dialysis. Yeah. So it's, it's not a brilliant option either. Yeah. Um, so bo both techniques have, have advantages and disadvantages. You know, your really crisp patient can do home hemodialysis, but that doesn't really sound like this fellow. No. Yeah. And uh, then there's a wa huge water issue. So yeah. if someone's on hemodialysis, it's hundreds of litres of water every yeah. week. Yeah. Um, so I remember going to Roma and a, a gentleman, you can use bore water um, for dialysis, but it's an absolute nightmare. So mm. you need so much water. So if you're in drought-stricken central Queensland, mm. Mm. I mean, where do you get 900 litres a week? Do you know what I mean? So for them to hemodialyse yeah, at home. <laughs> and also, too, if you're if this gentleman's by himself living at home, um, um, you know, the risk of infection for peritoneal dialysis is high. Mm -hmm. You know, if the water quality is not great, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's a high risk of having infections in your water infections, mm -hmm. you know, around your site, as you mentioned. Um, and for some... Um, places where there is um, sort of stagnant water and stuff like that, you can actually easily get pseudomonas um, in your catheter. And usually once you've got pseudomonas, the catheter actually has to come out. So yeah. it's huge, <clears throat> yeah. But the travel, he would need to either relocate, yeah. like if he was mm. going to be in centre on dialysis, dialysis. Yeah. I mean, that's the end of his life as he knows it, really. I mean, this guy is um, unemployed. Yeah. And he's, I gather he's on an invalid pension. 
disability like you know, permanent. Yeah. So, the, the people like this, I find, tend to congregate in in rural and regional towns because the cost of living, not the cost of living, but the cost of accommodation, is mm. often lesser. Uh, and so, particularly in the periphery of regional areas, you'll you see a bit of a congregation. Mm. Um, unfortunately, uh, the closer you get to a dialysis unit. The, the cost of mm. rent goes up. Mm. Uh, so that's a bit of a problem. But mm. I, we don't see a lot of these people in small country towns because they just can't survive mm. in that country town. They've got to leave, unfortunately. And, and we so have a lot of patients that relocate um, from elsewhere mm. to Toowoomba purely because they're dialysis dependent and, and that is actually easier for them, but the cost is huge. So do we think this could have been prevented? One of the most satisfying things I find in practice is when you have a diabetic who's starting to go off and if, you know, for many people diabetes is not something you can see. They don't have a broken leg, they don't have, you know, something really obvious yeah. to see. That's very difficult for the average person. Mm. When you can present them with numbers that are changing, uh, and I get my diabetics to chart their BSLs, to chart their blood pressures. I, I show them their creatinine levels changing, and uh, and, and particularly I think the, the vascular changes in the eye and the feet are really much more obvious to them. Mm -hmm. And so I find that one of the most satisfying things is when you get somebody who's starting to get some peripheral changes in their feet, uh, or you can see that their renal function's going off, and. And, and it, if, you've, if you focus them on understanding the, the more objective aspects of their disease, they can see when that's happening and, the, and, it, and it actually causes behaviour change. Yeah. So you'll start to see them take more engagement in the condition because they can see something objective changing. Uh, and then you see it objectively change for the better as, mm. uh, as they improve their, their condition. Um, so I find that really satisfying. But the other things that I'd be thinking about preventing this happening is that this fellow's management is intensely complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I really shy away from um, insulin as much as possible. Obviously at times it becomes necessary. Mm -hmm. When it becomes necessary, I tend to really be cautious about using um, short-acting insulins uh, because they're hard to do. Yes. And if you're out by yourself, then yeah. um, a, a couple of patients we've had that have come back, we've actually taken them off insulin, really buffed up their, their glyptin use, their diet, um, got the appropriate metformin happening, get some weight loss going, um, and uh, you can sometimes uh, delay significantly the, the time to insulin, and all of those things make life a lot more simple. Mm. I think the other thing that we need to consider in this fellow is his management of his hypertension is very complex, mm. and again, that's going to impact upon how, in terms of preventing renal damage, mm. um, good management of, di of uh, hypertension is very important for preserving uh, renal function. Um, Spencer, what do you think of this chap's medication regime? Any bugbears or things you would change? Um, well, yes, I guess it's not it's not dreadful. Okay? It's, mm -hmm. it's it's pretty pretty sensible collection of drugs. Um, in the acute setting, obviously, uh, if you're sick enough to be in hospital, you're sick oh. enough to stop metformin, uh, at least temporarily. And uh, clearly, there are guidelines about ceasing metformin entirely when your GFR falls. And, and Dr. Cook has already mentioned that, in fact, metformin is probably not as toxic as we think it is, and we can still sneak a tiny little bit of it in. But so I, I don't have a clear cut cut off for when you know which GFR would I stop metformin. But certainly, anybody in this setting where they're sick acutely, the metformin has to go immediately, and it stays off the list until they are stable. And then uh, you may consider reintroducing it as part of their um, as part of their medium to long term diabetic management. Um, I'm wary about mixed heart. It's not my favourite insulin at all, mm. um, and I, I probably I could say I don't prescribe that anymore. And this guy should probably be just on, on long acting insulins. Um, the olmosartan, amlodipine, and hydrochlorothiazide. It's lovely that it's in one pill, and that will improve um, uh, compliance. Um, and I think an A2RB or an ACE inhibitor, not, not in combination, but one or the other, mm -hmm. is really the cornerstone of hypertension management for, for diabetic patients. Um, and the data um, that makes it better than other drugs uh, applies only to those diabetic patients who already have proteinuria. Yeah. 
um, but they're good antihypertensive drugs anyway, so they tend to be the, the first thing that we reach for. Now, in this particular guy who's got an acute renal failure um, and, a, uh, and hyperkalemia, mm -hmm. maybe we need to stop the olmosartan transiently. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't... Uh, I think, if we, again, another message for general practice is that although ACE inhibitors and ARBs are regarded as, as renal toxic drugs and what if they've got renal artery stenosis, in, in fact, they're, they're, they're good drugs and they need to be continued but with appropriate monitoring. So yeah. in a patient with you know, uncontrolled hyperkalemia, yes, you're going to have to stop the ACE inhibitor or the ARB and maybe not reintroduce it. But if you can get the potassium under control, then, then resume use of the, of the ARB. Um, and even in that setting, when you acutely start it, the GFR may go up, uh, sorry, may go down, the creatinine may go up, um, and you'd accept uh, you know, a 25% rise in, in creatinine just from putting the ACE inhibitor on board. So long as it's not a continuing thing, it's, a, it's an acute process and then it, and it plateaus, um, you know, you'd wear that. Uh, because you're going to get additional renal protection and reasonable blood pressure control mm -hmm. from the uh, from the olmosartan. Uh, look, I quite like calcium channel blockers. Um, there is, in fact, the data for reduction of proteinuria actually rests with verapamil and diltiazem, um, but we tend not to see them used in combination mm -hmm. very much. But that's that's what the data shows, and certainly the guidelines say that you can use the non dihydropyridines like amlodipine or lurconidipine and. And, and I'm happy with that. And we've obviously heard Dr Cook say that she prefers lurconidipine mm -hmm. uh, in view of its uh, slight reduction in, uh, in peripheral edema side effects. Um, hydrochlorothiazide, neither here nor there. It's a good blood pressure drug. We really want blood pressure control. Mm -hmm. um, but if his blood pressure is falling, maybe we'd drop the hydrochlorothiazide to enhance his, uh, his sugar control because it and beta blockers are certainly recognised as promoting insulin resistance and, and, and increasing insulin requirement, which you might perhaps not want in the, in the diabetic patient. Thank you. Um, very briefly, do we have any questions from the audience for tonight's panel? Being very quiet. One thing, one patient that we've had down at um, at uh, Clifton is a fellow who I think got overdosed on his um, ACE inhibitors, uh, and uh, it's the fellow that we had that um, had uh, the episode on his quad bike, and uh, I think we thought initially that he was having a um, some sort of a TIA might have occurred, uh, but then he was getting significant postural hypotension mm. associated with his ACE inhibitors, and uh, uh, it, they'd been crept up, and, and when we brought it down, I think you've, you've got to have an ACE inhibitor on board. It, it takes a lot for me to stop it completely, but I think it's very easy in people that have um, not great control of their own blood pressure. That, uh, you've got to be very careful not to overdose them, and, and to me, there's um, as, as important as it is to go bring the blood pressure down, you've got to be very careful in these people who may already have some uh, peripheral neuropathy, mm -hmm. uh, their balance is, is not great. Mm -hmm. uh, Autonomic neuropathy as well. Yeah. 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 And yeah. if you yeah. compromise yeah. that um, uh, even, even further, the chances mm -hmm. of, of hip Force fractures. And, and in fact, one of the reasons I was um, very late getting here tonight is that we had to admit a fellow who uh, is had a fall in the um, in the shower and you know we, we'd clearly caused the fall it was iatrogenic mm. because we overdosed him on on these uh, antihypertensives and it, it's a fine line that general mm. practice yeah. walks uh, um, yeah. in these matters I, if I can just say yeah. one thing about uh, that particular point one of the uh, biggest things that we don't uh, recognize enough is that there are foods that do increase blood pressure one of the biggest ones is MSG and we know that in some of the flavour enhancers. Mm. So things like people um, having two-minute noodles, it's cheap, you can eat them, you put your flavour mm. sachet in. Um, even the uh, skin and the stuffing in uh, barbecue chickens has a lot of MSG, and you can get... And we watch patients who actually do have it, and their blood pressure goes up and goes down. So before we start them on a medication, we see them for a cold board medical, and they come in and they're blood pressure's high, I'll give them a, a blood pressure monitor and send them home and say, give me your food diary, give me your blood pressure. Um, and so what can actually happen sometimes is you might go ahead and prescribe a medication for a patient that has got elevated blood pressure. Mm. If they don't eat their two-minute noodles or that, that particular food mm. that caused that... Better. Yeah, well, no, that caused that artificial rise in their blood pressure, mm. they will be hypotensive. Yeah. <laughs> So having a look at their diet and asking them, yeah, what mm. they are eating a lot of, given that, you know, that cheap... Same food. problem as the white coat effect. Yeah, where the patient's white persistently coat. hypertensive in your clinic room, mm. but yeah. he's perfectly fine with the pharmacist I've, next to yeah. I've <laughs> got to say that I'm, I'm becoming much more uh, used to having patients bring in their 
I was going to use a trade name, but they're electronic um, yes. blood pressure machine. Now, the accuracy of these yeah. is probably marg or variable, but I think the trend analysis yes. of it is really mm -hmm. important. And uh, we started to invest, and I think this is a, a really useful thing in rural areas, in, in um, buying up these things uh, and then mm -hmm. lending them out to patients and, uh, and then they bring them in. And you can actually tap through, but uh, a trap that I've found is you're tapping through looking at the blood pressures and suddenly there's one that's really, really low and you think, oh, well, this is a worry. But, you know, the grandchildren have got hold of it and they've, they've yeah, done oh their blood God. pressure off. <laughs> mm. So I think you've got to be careful. And, uh, but they're incredibly useful and I think gets rid of that white coat effect yeah. Uh, that clearly yeah. happens uh, when they come in, and, and particularly when we're talking high stakes cases like this, where yeah. you know, you're sweating on the things that you find. And another one I find that's very useful is to um, is to have a student um, do the blood pressure, then talk to the patient, and then do the blood pressure again yeah. um, and again. And um, they become students are a lot less uh, um, intimidating than us. Yeah, <laughs> I'm intimidated. <laughs> I think too for younger patients, there are lots of apps that they can mm. use where they key in mm. lots of their things and then you can, they come to clinic and it's there for mm. you. Mm. So I think for my younger people that are really into the technology, that's been really good too. Mm. Well, thank you very much. I was going to um, say, don't yes. underestimate postural blood pressure. So for mm. your diabetic patients, check them sitting, sitting but then stand yeah. them up and check it two minutes later mm. and you can give yourself a fright sometimes doing that. And we do that in renal clinics all the time. So when a yeah. patient's finished dialysis, we do their lying and then they're standing, and yeah, it gives you a shock sometimes. <laughs> yeah, mm. so it's that postural element that's really important. Fantastic. Well, it's been another fascinating panel discussion, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, thank you to Hilary for your excellent case presentation. My pleasure. Thank um, and thank you to each of our specialist and expert panellists for their extremely valuable co contribution to tonight's discussion. <laughs> I'd also like to finish with a special thanks to the support of the Digital Media Services of USQ. That's it for another QRME Rural Medicine Grand Rounds. You can see our earlier presentations in the series on our QRME YouTube channel. Next year, the series will continue with more great topics and panellists running quarterly from Thursday the 5th of March. We look forward to having you join us then. Good night.